So good evening, everyone. Welcome to this session on advances in AI, advances in AI ML for future networks. We are lucky to have two illustrious uh, researchers in our midst to give keynotes. And without wasting too much time on introductions, they are uh, really well known in any case. I will quickly call upon them one by one to talk to us and make us a little more aware of the things that are happening. I'll start with Dr. Harvey, who is uh, working for Rakuten Mobile Innovation Studio. And today he's going to tell us a bit about the AI ML Standards Roundup. Uh, Dr. Harvey, please. Thank you very much. Um, very nice to be here. Very nice to be with. Thank you very much to the team for inviting me along today. Um, if Ashif could share the screen, please. Uh, okay. okay, so thank you very much. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, I guess today I'm going to talk about choosing the autonomous driver. Um, but just a little bit before I begin, um, I'm part of the Rakuten Mobile Innovation Studio. Uh, we're a new research lab based within Rakuten Mobile. Um, we have a purpose of achieving truly autonomous networking, um, and we're a small group of people who are excited to tackle the problem. So very nice to be here today. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so um, I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with this, but just to kind of briefly set up the context, uh, networks used to look like this. You would have uh, different phones who were able to communicate with each other, either through the same network or through other networks. Uh, in the next slide, you can see kind of the advancement with more phones coming in and then the ability to connect to the internet. The next slide you know, brings us very quickly to the reality that we see today. With so many different devices connecting with each other, um, as well as to the internet. And what you see here on the next slide is the, the pressure that we begin to see being faced by this, where we have increased connections and services being placed upon the network that sits in the middle. You have the reality of the increased cost of operation, as well as, uh, interestingly, the limitation of the human in this. Like uh, As was mentioned in the introduction, we move towards software-based networking. And in reaction to that, when we have software systems operating, it goes beyond what humans can do. And as was pointed out to me the other day, sometimes what humans are interested to do. If something happens at less than a second, very infrequently, perhaps the human is not motivated to respond to it. So if we move to the next slide, we can see that the challenge we undertake, or we see here, is the need for autonomous networking. So this is our head of department, and I stole one of his little phrases the other day. So the purpose here is with all this software and all these different pressures, instead of hunting down bugs, fixing problems, and completing menial tasks, we want our engineers to work on innovating new services and technologies and hand off these mundane tasks to an autonomous network. Um, so that, that's the, the challenge that we see to undertake. And of course, as in this session, this is going to require all manner of new and interesting technologies. So if we go to the next slide, we see this vision that we have um, and the task that we're pursuing ourselves internally is to achieve this autonomous network through this autonomy engine, this uh, collection of control plane, with controllers doing things inside the network. So don't want to get into that too much, but the interesting thing is even if we were finished and we had all this wonderful technology that could autonomously operate or self-manage the network all by itself, on the next slide, we see the question of, so what? What's the purpose? What's the goal we're trying to achieve? Like Just because the mechanism exists, it, what, what's driving this? So if you look on the next slide, you can see this idea of like, how does one specify purpose? How does one give a goal uh, or you know, a meaning of what it is that you're trying to achieve? So there are three different examples on the slide. So one is the kind of notion of imperative policy. So in this situation, you have the idea of written down ahead of time by a human being where you have the event where something should be triggered, a set of conditions that you know, guard or prevent entry into a situation, and then the action to be followed. Separate to that, and slightly differently, is the notion of declarative policy. So here you have the idea where you kind of write down rules of what should be happened. So in the paragraph, you can see there uh, a kind of English text description of a situation of what you can do and when you can't do it. You then refine that into predicate sentences. So you can work in the lab and you have finished your training. 
which can then be turned into a symbolic representation where Boolean predicate logic can be assembled. And this stuff is really good for like, you want to check for access violations, you want to check for configuration mismatches, so that before you actually deploy something, you check, does it make sense? And then thirdly, uh, as has become quite popular recently, especially in the industrial side of things, is the notion of you know, intent. Whereas opposed to, as opposed to specifying rules that you want to achieve or very accurately writing down everything that should happen, what you do is you say, well, this is what should happen. This is my goal. This is what I would like to have achieved. Not what, but how. Uh, not how, but what, sorry. So if you go to the next slide, uh, just to give an example of the declarative one, uh, this is uh, something that IBM have been working on, their autonomy manager. So this is the video that I took from their website where they discuss what's happening here. And if we zoom in on the next slide, we can see that the tool that they have, what you can do is specify service constraints. So rather than saying very specifically defined rules, what you can just say that is, well, when memory is greater than or equal to 500, find anything that fits that category and go ahead and deploy something. So there's no notion of what the machine is, a particular ID or anything like that. It's just a kind of general declarative statement. And then whenever situations fit that, you can pursue it. Anyway, if we go to the next slide, we go back to this idea of intent. Right? That's kind of what I want to talk about today. So on the left coming in, you have the intent, you know, the human description of what it is you want to have happen. There's this magical black box. And then what out pops the other side is how it should happen. So there's a very clear separation between these things. And on the next slide, you can see that when you look inside the black box, what a lot of people have done have combined things like machine learning, network orchestration, and domain knowledge. And these things together are the process of to take what it is that's said to turn it into how it can be achieved. And if you go one step further, this usually requires two key points to be uh, maintained uh, on the next slide, uh, is this idea of kind of configuration operation. So the how becomes either you know, a setup or to be deployed with particular ports being assigned in different ways or particular logic as how to service should be orchestrated or operated. So on the next slide, we can uh, step back a little bit and decompose this further. So here you have the idea where the human generates the intent. So uh, our CTO was telling me, wouldn't it really be just nice if you could just speak to the machine and have everything happen magically? So the human generates what it is that they want to happen. Like I want to optimize for costs or I want to optimize for efficiency. This is then somehow transformed into a structured representation, not human English or, or any language, but a very something more akin to what you would find in a programming language. And of course, this can be a feedback loop as the system can potentially even interrogate the human being. Then the structured intent can be transformed into something, here I call it a controller, but the point here is just its purpose is to somehow achieve the, the kind of the how by interacting with some kind of virtual infrastructure, by giving it commands, by giving it configurations, and also by having telemetry come back to help it iteratively and constantly be aware of what's happening. So if we go to the next slide, we can split this into two parts. So on the left here um, is a very well-defined kind of translation of human meaning. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, you can see that this is very well trodden ground with so many people having worked on this topic, standards bodies, companies, academia. It's a very well trodden space. So I don't really want to talk about that today. Instead, if we go to the next slide, I want to focus on this idea of how to take structured intent and to give it to turn it into some kind of controller that can actually instigate action on this virtual infrastructure. So if you go to the next slide, the, the question and the kind of, I guess, the new way of thinking about things, or the different way of thinking things I want to talk about here, is this idea of pre-built knowledge versus exploration. So in situations like the very first one, the imperative policy we talked about, human being has to sit down and write down everything. When this should happen, if you see this event and these conditions hold, this should happen. Okay? This is very kind of akin to this idea of fully connected on the left here. It's very well done, very well uh, documented and prescribed. Something less so is this uh, kind of sparse collections. This is akin to things where you have like policy databases. So for example, if in the, the human intent, I find the word SLA or I find the words performance and energy, then perhaps I have a database matching sets of actions that can be put together with those words to try to achieve the goal that I want. But that still requires a human being to write something down. It requires someone to think and say, how do I map this 
desire to some reasonable set of actions. Alternatively, a different way of doing this is this idea of search-based. And in this situation, you, you don't have a particular, you just have the kind of primitive actions in front of you. What you don't have is, is a mapping. So if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> this concept is not new. Um, so this is a paper from Google in summer. And in this paper, what they did was they used this, uh, this idea of kind of search-based exploration to discover all these existing machine learning algorithms by itself. On the left, you can see on the screen here, it starts with just a very empty program. And then over time, by trying out different things and by searching for answers, it was able to successfully rediscover many different uh, technologies. And then even in the end, getting to something better than what human beings already understood how to achieve. So if you go to the next slide, you can see the similar concept. Uh, in this case, it's evolution-based design. So again, searching, having the machine search for a solution to the problem. problem. So here, this was NASA trying to design antenna. Um, at the top there, the picture shows something the human being came up with, very heavy, very standard looking antenna. And then the bottom, you can see these kind of very interesting designs that the machine was able to come up with. That in the end was better, gave better coverage, better efficiency, was cheaper, it was much more suited to the problem. And human being wasn't involved in the creation of these things. So if you go to the next slide, we have this idea that, in this case, evolution in particular becomes a process of creativity. It becomes a, a mechanical way that we can begin to take the idea of how to create new things, how to form new mappings between different places without requiring predefined relationships to be given. And this has the wonderful idea of separating out, but it gives you the ability to explore the unknown. So if you go to the next slide, we have adopted this principle um, in our approach to how to achieve this autonomous networking, <clears throat> and in particular, the creation of uh, achieving goals. So here you can see a bunch of different Lego pieces. Uh, each of them is responsible for some different performance of optimization uh, or operation. So for example, time series databases or BGP announcement based uh, detection of holes or different linear optimization or hybrid regression model to do decision or classification. Um, and so the idea here is that in the same way, using this kind of evolutionary genetic approach, we are able to put these things together to create these controllers as we saw before. And if you go to the next slide, it's important to point at this, to say at this point, there are many different very interesting and useful and meaningful technologies that can be used to classify information, to make decisions, to learn. Um, and in this approach, using this kind of evolutionary way, it doesn't matter which of these ones that we would want to use. Each of them are very good um, at different situations and different scenarios. And if you're able to quantify them as tools that can be used, then they can become a Lego block um, that can be then assembled as necessary by the evolutionary approach to see what works and what makes sense. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we can see this idea of how this might unravel. Uh, apologies, we're going to have a few next slide statements. So step one is you have a controller, um, and it somehow has a score of how well it's achieving the goal that it wants to have. Thank you. Um, and then over time, what you can see is the evolution of this controller into different forms and the resultant score that you see. And on the next slide, it continues. And on the next slide, it continues. And so you end up with a time series going through time of trying to find the right way to, to maximize or even just achieve a goal that is satisfactory. And an important point to know at this point is if you go to the next slide, you can see that two of these different controllers or two of the same approach in time that is different will not give the same result. And this is because, particularly in a mobile phone network that we have, the environment is not static. It's always changing. The, the users running through it, the technology being deployed, the configuration of the technology being deployed. And that's why an online system is necessary that not only is kind of fulfilling the need of the goal that you have, but also assuring through time that it can be achieved. So if you go to the next slide. Um, this isn't just uh, us saying this would be really nice. This graph here represents uh, some previous work that we did based on IP stack composition. And this is showing that this technique or this approach in action. Uh, this is uh, different clients talking to each other across the internet. So this is uh, something that we're expanding upon. 
So if you go to the next slide, when we put all this together, um, this represents the architecture or the principle, the conceptual architecture, I guess, that we're trying to follow. So here you have this notion of a controller, the controllers working together, as well as this uh, concept of an adaptation factory, which is achieving this evolution, and this knowledge center that contains it. Thank you. So next slide, please. Um, so just to, to kind of wrap it up is this idea of uh, online. This approach is adaptive to situations as they change. It is not required to build specific math meetings beforehand, and it's independent of the platform you want to deploy on. So if we go to the next slide, uh, then one of the challenges to be aware of here is just the state space explosion. So the idea that there are very many different combinations that we can have. But on the next slide, we can see that we can help to constrain this through different things such as ontologies and taxonomies to help us filter and effectively answer the question. So if you just go to the next slide, uh, and the next slide. Cool. So as you can see before in what we would like to achieve, there are so many different pieces and so many different parts. And this is kind of what I wanted to get to today is that in order to have a, a successful system that can not only work for us, but work for others or work together or to be truly interoperable, we need to define and understand exactly what all these different pieces mean, what they should look like and how they can work together with different things. And so as part of why I'm here today to talk about is the need for kind of standardization activities around what does a Lego block look like? How do you represent a goal? What does the appropriate mechanism to have an interface to an evolutionary algorithm look like? What does knowledge really mean? How do we define autonomy? How do we define intelligence? And so clear definition and description of these things is important. And if we go to the next slide, um, it's important to know sometimes you just don't know what it is that you're, everybody can see a part of it. And so that's why it's important, like activities such as the TSDI itself, it's important to bring people together to answer these questions. So if we go to the next slide, um, I wanted to point out if you are interested um, to explore some of these topics and to come together, we will be proposing this uh, new focus group on autonomous networking within the ITUT. And one of the real points I would like to emphasize here is that we're interested in creating an open platform for collaborative standardization, pre-standardization, and exploration. This isn't about who says what or who has the right technology to push. This is about coming together and collaboratively trying to understand what these things mean and how we can achieve them together so that everybody can benefit. Um, and so with that, I go to the next slide so that you know if you're interested to hear more about these things, there will be a webinar held by the ITUT on this very topic on the 3rd of November at 10 o'clock Central European time. Uh, please do come along. And with that, I go to my final slide and say thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I hope if it wasn't interesting, at least it was somewhat entertaining. Um, and please do get in touch. Please come and hear what we have to say, follow up with us. Um, so thank you very much for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Dr. Habib. That was an excellent talk. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Which we had some time for questions and answers. I would encourage uh, the attendees to ask questions on chat or on the questions. You know, so you can, uh, surely give your perspective on what you've been thinking about the talks. We might not be able to answer during the talks, but we'll certainly try to get back to you. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Harvey. It was really nice to see how, uh, well, I shouldn't use the word how right. So what to the how? How does the <laughs> machine learning work? So thank you so much. Yeah, I, I really like the talk. And uh, after Paul, we have uh, Professor Bhattacharya. Professor Bhattacharya, who is the former director of IIT Patna, and now he's gone back to IIT Bombay as a professor in the uh, Computer Science and Engineering Department. Thank you so much, Professor Bhattacharya, for making time. Today, yes. he's going to talk to us about mapping of techniques, data sets, and tools in context of innovations in AI ML. Professor Bhattacharya, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lal. Uh, Akash, if you could, yeah. My, screen's, uh, my screen is visible. My slides are visible to everybody. Uh, now, I'll, I'd will i like to talk about innovations in AI ML, AI ML and map, mapping of techniques, data sets, tools uh, from a perspective of low resource setting. 
So my area of uh, work is natural language processing. And uh, India is home to about 780 languages, 22 of them are scheduled. And most of these languages have what is called low resource. They are low resource in terms of tools, data, and we need uh, good standardization, good mapping, so that resources get created and we can do computation. So I thoroughly enjoyed Paul's talk. Uh, networks really connect people. And on top of the network platform, we do many interesting things. One of them is natural language processing. Language also connects people, but language also places a barrier in communication from people to people. Uh, so in the roadmap, uh, I'll talk about natural language processing and the ambiguity challenge that comes with natural language processing. That is the main challenge. I'll uh, give, us, give an example of low resource computing in terms of machine translation and the AI standardization effort that is going on in the country. I'll give a glimpse of that. Next slide, please. So natural language processing is the art, science, and technique of making computers understand and generate language. Uh, so natural language processing is really a very important test bed for machine learning techniques. Natural language processing draws the techniques from machine learning. Machine learning uh, draws many, many problems, very interesting problems from natural language processing. So there is tremendous synergy between these two fields uh, these days. And the field was born in 1960s when there was Cold War between Russia and USA. And that uh, led both the countries trying to understand each other's messages. And uh, that required machine transition between these two languages. Uh, let's go move forward. Next slide. So uh, natural language processing is very important. And I'm very fond of giving this example, uh, namely startup on call center analytics. So there's an insurance company. I have anonymized the company. Uh, the company wants to deal with the customer complaints, but the volume is very large. That, therefore, they have engaged a startup company to deal with these complaints, which can be escalated or attended to. But uh, uh, the startup also is not able to cope with the volume of the task. It requires automation. And many times the complaints are in spoken form, so we need automatic speech recognition technology followed by natural language understanding technology, which will make sense of what the person said. And finally, the most important part, the sentiment analysis of the customer who interacts with the company. So it requires natural language understanding, automatic speech recognition, and sentiment, to repeat the point. Next slide. Uh, I'll give you some examples of ambiguity. We use language every day, uh, effortlessly, uh, unconsciously, I would say. Uh, one of the examples of ambiguity is lexical ambiguity, ambiguity arising from words and phrases. So there is this question, what is the difference between in-laws and outlaws? Answer, outlaws are wanted. So there is a play on the ambiguity of the word wanted, which makes the dialogue interesting. There is another question, why one should never date a tennis player? Because love means nothing to them. Again, the play is on the ambiguity of the word love and nothing. Next slide. A more serious and more complex kind of ambiguity is what is called dependency ambiguity. It comes from the structure of the sentence, the way the words relate to each other. This was a sentence in Times of India. Maharashtra reports increased uh, COVID-19 cases. So it is reported by Maharashtra government that COVID-19 cases have increased. But suppose you look up on reports as a verb and not as a noun, then something interesting happens. Maharashtra reports increased COVID-19 cases, which means it is the Maharashtra reports that have increased COVID-19 cases. So that meaning is very strange and very funny also. But the ambiguity is uh, not real. This kind of ambiguity is not uh, really uncommon. It happens all the time. Next slide. A more, uh, much more complex uh, kind of ambiguity is pragmatic ambiguity, which uh, arises due to the difference in meaning of the surface on the surface of the sentence and the underlying meaning. Look at the uh, picture of the lady. She says, wow, well done. Uh, but the body language is very negative. So the sentence is, thank you for sending me to Delhi and my luggage to Mumbai. Brilliant service. The chatbot replies, thank you for the appreciation. The chatbot did not catch the sarcasm. So we, in our lab, worked uh, on sarcasm for a long time. Uh, and we uh, really 
uh, understood that incongruity of surface meaning and deep underlying meaning is really the issue here. And we uh, created algorithms for doing, uh, for solving this problem. Next slide. Uh, natural language processing is a layered uh, operation. It starts with morphology, goes through part of speech, chunking, parsing, semantics, discord. These are technical terms, but very simply put, uh, natural language processing first breaks the word into its parts, then does uh, uh, then does uh, the finding of noun, verb, adjective, adverb, etc. It creates semantic tree. It disambiguates the words. It does uh, uh, correct semantic role labeling and does pragmatics and discourse processing. All these are very involved us, and everywhere we have ambiguity uh, to be uh, tackled. And uh, natural language processing is also at least a three-dimensional problem. There is this language axis, problem axis, and algorithm axis. Computer scientists and uh, linguists are called upon to interact with each other. Many times the other uh, branches of knowledge also are brought to uh, use. Physics, for example, uh, philosophy, and um, cognitive science, they're heavily used for solving natural language processing problems. Uh, next slide, please. Now, these days, uh, deep neural networks are the de facto techniques for AI. Um, there are many layers of deep learning. And what happens is that every layer does something useful, many times opaque to the observer. We do not know what is going on inside the network. But at the outermost layer, we obtain decision on the input. So if you look at the input sentence, no docs, please. Now, this is again an ambiguous sentence. Docs are welcome or not welcome. It depends on where you place the pause. No. Dogs, please. So dogs are welcome. No dogs, please. So here dogs are not welcome. So from the context, the deep neural network should be able to do processing of large amount of information and obtain the uh, correct decision with respect to the context. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, machine learning is uh, has very has become very important for many many fields for natural language processing also, uh, but the problem with machine learning is that the more sophisticated the technique, more opaque is the framework also. So the simplest form of machine learning is table lookup. You build a table to, for example, you understand uh, a, a pattern as A by storing different ways A is written, but that's not very um, uniform that doesn't capture the general generalities so you we go to rule based system uh, uh, make uh, capturing the uh, underlying regularities in the patterns then we go to statistical machine learning which is data driven and finally deep neural network which is extremely data driven and also very open so explainability goes on reducing as we go from uh, pre um, raw table lookup to deep neural network but the robustness goes on increasing Next slide, please. So natural language processing areas are uh, machine translation, information extraction, question answering, sentiment, and emotional analysis. These interact with uh, real life situations, and they are really very useful. Machine translation, many of you might have used Google Translate, Bing Translate. So they have brought uh, a lot of benefits to life in society. But uh, all these useful areas of NLP draw their techniques from rules, logic, search, and learning, many of which are extremely mathematical in nature. We make heavy use of probability theory, for example. Next slide, please. Uh, all this work that uh, is going on, we also participate, contribute to this. Uh, there is the Center for Indian Language Technology, which is in, uh, which is in um, uh, IIT Bombay. And this is, has been there since 2000. And, uh, all areas of natural language processing has been uh, has been investigated there. Uh, next slide, please. A relatively new lab is AI NLP machine learning group in IIT Patna, which I set up in 2015 when I joined there as director. Next slide, please. Now I'll uh, take a very specific problem, low resource machine translation using neural network. And the languages are Hindi, Marathi, Bengali, and English. This will uh, underline the importance of resources and tools and how complex how a complex problem can be solved by making use of many of the uh, many of the tricks which come from uh, other areas of natural language processing and machine learning next slide please so uh, the indian languages are uh, uh, very complex as i said there is huge diversity of uh, language in the country 
Now, uh, they are written in many different scripts. There are 22 major languages in the country written in 13 different scripts with over 720 dialects. You can have code mixing. Uh, QEA hesitation, for example, or gerundification, Gadi chalawing. So we are using the ing suffix of English to a Hindi stem, which is chalana. Uh, so there are lots of uh, problems due to absence of NLP tools and resources. Uh, refer, refer to the NLP pipeline, absence of linguistic tradition for many languages, for example, Andaman, Nicobar, there the linguistic tradition needs to be um, created. A lot of linguistic work has happened, but they have to be exploited in computational linguistics and natural language processing. Script complexity in non-standard input mechanism is also a big challenge. Next slide, please. Uh, non-standard transliteration, mango, is arm in hindi but arm is written in am aam capital am so this is this this non-standardization non-standard storage many newspapers for example have their proprietary fonts and uh, uh, that information is effectively inaccessible for computational purposes challenging language phenomena like compound verbs verbs wo haspara haspara in hindi in hindi means abruptly started laughing parna is to fall so literally, this uh, means laugh and fall. So, uh, so fall is coming as an intensifier here. And then there can be morphological stacking. You can have long words in a sentence, in a language. This is a uh, Marathi word, which means uh, the, the person in front of my house. And then there is resource scarcity, which I have already mentioned. Uh, go ahead, please. Next slide. Yeah, so this is the uh, status of uh, uh, status of situation in with respect to NLP tools and resources for Indian languages. There are many important things like morphological processing, part of speech tagging, chunking, many NLP tasks, and the column shows many languages. There are a few cells which are failed. Other cells, other cells need a lot of work to create those systems and resources and tools. Next slide, please. So in neural machine translation, the word comes in uh, as a sentence, the sentence comes in and the output is a sentence in another language. So this is an example of French to English machine translation. And uh, Troya Lapid of Grenoble, this means three rabbits of Grenoble. So it goes through an encoder stage, then through a decoder stage. And finally, the, the translated sentence comes out. Uh, next slide, please. So this requires a huge amount of data, but we have found way of uh, getting reasonable, respectable accuracy in spite of absence of high quality resource in large amount. Uh, quality is good, but the amount is less. So we know how to do phrase table injection. Words are used as features. Words are broken into their parts, and those are translated. And we have done extensive experimentation on 56 systems for each of these techniques. I will very rapidly show you some numbers to get a sense of how uh, techniques and a little bit of increase in data can uh, give dramatic improvement in the accuracy. Next slide, please. The neural machine translation is uh, typically a bi LSTM encoder decoder. The more recent advancement of neural machine translation is through Transformer. Next slide, please. So we uh, took Hindi, Punjabi, Bengali, Gujarati, Marathi uh, from uh, North India and Tamil, Telugu and, and Malayalam from South India. Uh, the number of data items were about 50,000 sentences, which is small by today's standard, but we could make use of various tricks to get reasonably high accuracy. Uh, next slide, please. So we mainly report uh, English Marathi machine translation because it is a large government of India project given to IIT Bombay, speech to speech machine translation in from English to Marathi in educational domain. So this will be found useful in uh, engineering colleges, for example, where uh, students, even in the higher education institutes, students have difficulty with English and they're more comfortable with their mother tongue. So English Marathi report the accuracy as 10.79 blue points. I'll not explain what is blue point, but 10.79 is a unit of performance. Now, this is the baseline system, it, the, just a basic neural machine transfer system. Next slide, please. So when we increase the data, so PM India is a corpus where uh, uh, the PM's speech is translated into many languages. When we inject that data, next slide. The accuracy improves from 10 to 40, you see. The next slide. 
then we uh, introduced a phrase table in, in injection which are phrases obtained from statistical machine translation on parallel sentences they get added to the neural network data now the accuracy becomes 14.63 next slide please then we used what is called back translation and the accuracy goes up to 14.73 next slide please Forward translation break makes the accuracy 16.47. See the amount of uh, increase in the accuracy from 14 to 16.47. Next slide. Then uh, there is a big jump in accuracy when we make use of many embellishments along with phrase table injection. The accuracy goes to 21. And really, the quality also goes on improving as the numbers improve. Next slide, please. So here is a consolidation of these embellishments and our final accuracy was 21.91 with that uh, small amount of data, just 50,000 uh, sentences embellished with prime minister's corpus to an extent, but all these tricks actually of phrase, uh, phrase injection and breaking the word into its part uh, gave an accuracy of about 22 blue points. Next slide. Uh, so proof of pudding is in eating it. There is a demo, uh, there is an interface which can be used uh, for English Mar Hindi Marathi machine translation system. Next slide. Here is some qualitative output. English uh, source sentence. I do know some young persons who are active in such campaigns. Uh, now the reference sentence is Asse kahi yubak mala mahita hai je asha prakarchi mohim chalavatat. This is the reference Marathi translation. Our output was Asse Kahi Tarun Vekti. Yuvak has become Tarun, okay, which is a synonym for Yuvak. We got that right. Mala Mahita hai Je Asha Prakarchi Mohim Chalavatat. So the sentence is almost same except for Yuvak and Tarun. Google translation output was Mala Asha Kahi Tarun Vekti Mahita hai Je Asha Mohima Madhe Sakri Ahit. Mohima Madhe Sakri Ahit is not really fully accurate. And if you take the Bing output, Asha Mohima Madhya Sakriya Astelek Ahi Tarun Mala Mahita Hai. So there is an interesting transformation which Bing has done. This is called participialization. So we have compared our system with uh, many established machine transition systems. And we uh, do see, even with very small amount of data, nothing compared to what you know these large industries have, we could uh, use these tricks and get reasonable accuracy. Next slide, please. So then the summary is that uh, we, even with small amount of data with uh, proper standardization and uh, apply, applying tricks, we can really improve the accuracy quite a lot. So there is really room for linguistic uh, insight and making use of uh, cognitive science and entropy-based methods, et cetera, to uh, improve the accuracy of the system. Next slide. Now I come to a very important topic, which is AI standard, standardization effort. Uh, this is under Bureau of Indian Standards. The AI standardization committee is uh, given the number LITD 30. Uh, next slide, please. And in October 2018, I became uh, the chairman of this committee with the responsibility of uh, uh, evolving standardization in AI systems. Next slide. So we want to make sure that uh, the uh, the committee did not co <coughs> compose of <coughs> did not consist of only electrical sciences electrical science computer science and it we really reached out to many many different uh, domains like manufacturing government and regulatory regulatory bodies airlines uh, railways agriculture all all different kinds of domains we wanted to have a lot of diversity from different fields government industry defense academia next slide please so uh, standardization in the area of artificial intelligence and big data, that was the mandate of this committee and members were from multinational corporations, transportation industry, healthcare, regulatory body, policy think tanks, e-commerce organization. This is a large body and with a lot of diversity. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, this LITD 30 is actually a mirror of the ISI standard which is SC42, which deals with artificial intelligence internationally. And uh, uh, India is participating in many activities, including leading the development of standard and process management framework for big data analytics. Next slide. Now the standard development process uh, in SC42, that is the international body on artificial intelligence is a new work item proposal, NWIP. Working draft is created, which is circulated to members, members of different countries different countries ai standardization body examine the draft then uh, if they pass it then something called p draft or preliminary draft is created
Indian working draft, and then uh, international standard is uh, frozen and it is published. Published. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now I really will hurry. Uh, there are uh, these adoption of uh, India uh, development of Indian standard and adoption of international standard. Both are very important. Next slide. And the st standardization in the area of AI uh, have many sub activities. Next slide. I'll very quickly show them. Next slide. So there are these panels for societal concern, pre standardization report on artificial intelligence, levels of certification of AI systems. That is, again, India's responsibility. Next slide. Artificial intelligence concepts and terminology. This is a uh, this is both an academic work and standardization work framework for AI systems using machine learning. Next slide. Uh, big data reference uh, architecture was another concern. Uh, uh, framework and application process needed to be discussed and frozen. Process management framework had to be done. Next slide. Artificial intelligence bias in AI systems, which has become so important these days, gender bias, race bias, all these bias have to be removed from the data. Assessment and robustness of neural networks is important. Uh, trustworthiness is important. Next. Risk management, societal concerns, ethical concerns. Next slide. Uh, then the most important inter inter interesting uh, exercise is use case discussion in artificial intelligence. And this is arguably the most fertile and interesting discussion on the scope of uh, LITD 30 and SC42. SC Next slide. And the overview of computational approaches also discussed. All these uh, are discussed internationally at many places of the world in regular periodic meetings. Next slide. So I'll make some concluding observations based on these discussions. Uh, standards is a matter of academia, industry, government interaction. And this is really a nice situation of exploration versus exploitation question. Academia explores and industry and startups exploit under the regulatory framework of government. Academia does proof of concept plus data and shows that something is possible and traction and monetization is done by the industry. This pipeline of proof of concept plus data going to traction, going to monetization is a must. This happens very successfully, for example, in the Bay Area, in the Silicon Valley. And academia research labs along with startup and industry can make this happen in our country also. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. I really appreciate your uh, uh, attention to the uh, topics discussed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bhattacharya. That was a very, very engaging talk. And that can be made out from the reactions that we got throughout this uh, presentation. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, and, and interestingly, it, it is very well connected to the other talk as well. Uh, because Paul wanted to move from intent to exploring how to set the network up. And you, uh, Professor Bhattacharya, told us how can that intent actually be mined? Exactly. How do we understand what that intent is about? Excellent, excellent. Sit. So so there, there's this interesting question that came up, uh, and it's actually for Dr. Harvey. Maybe we can take that up. And there's one question that I'll take up for you, Professor Bhattacharya, if you'd have the time. So the questions in the question session, somebody asked us, uh, and now where is that question gone? Um, did you answer that already? Uh, uh, so, he was, so about uh, self, uh, uh, you know, um, the self deployment and autonomous networks. He was asking us the difference about that. So could you comment on that, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Harvey? Then I'll come back to Professor Bhattacharya for a question. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a really good question. Um, Truthfully, to me, I think that they're very similar and mean very similar things, but I think it's more indicative of the bigger question and part of the standardization question in that what exactly is the definition of autonomy or self-management as, as applied to the different systems that we have, whether through its understanding what humans are trying to say or how we achieve what it is we want in our networks. Uh, so I think that's my answer to the question. Thank you. And uh, Professor Bhattacharya, to you, the question is, uh, it's quite clear that in, you know even mining the intent is is not a simple task. Now, when you take that intent and try to move it on to exploratory work to actually set the network up, so 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 do you think they should be looked at together or should they still be uh, you know researched as two different areas? What's your comment on that? Yeah, um, 
independent of you know underlying architecture or hardware the query intent itself is a challenging problem uh, as i you know discussed in the beginning of the talk anything any communication that is expressed in language uh, is fraught with ambiguity okay it starts with word level ambiguity then there is structural level ambiguity so uh, the ambiguity needs to be resolved from the context maybe you look at the queries which are already posed before and then solve the ambiguity so for example to give you an example uh, you know uh, the words which have multiple uh, meanings okay so uh, things like uh, uh, drinks available in the in the in in such and such areas okay drinks available in such and such areas so what does this drink mean okay what kind of drink soft drink hard drink in soft drink also which one coca cola mitanda and so on so there are since there are multiple possibilities you really have to resolve the ambiguity and then take it to hardware and implement implementation so they will go together but initial task is to resolve the language ambiguity itself thank you so much for that answer and uh, dr havi do you agree with that uh, you just a couple of sentences because we've run out of time your your inputs i defer to the expert on the subject as i said i'm very happy to stay away from taking what humans say and turning it to something my machines can understand so i'm happy to agree <laughs> okay, thank you so much thank you so much both of you and now we'll move on to the next session thanks everyone bye bye thank you